In this presentation, we're going to look at a very interesting example problem that has two modes. So let's discuss this problem. It consists of a beam that's rigid and is supported by two springs at either end. And we'll make the springs have the same stiffness, K. We're going to have an input force, F, acting on the left side of the beam and we'll denote the upward direction for F as the positive direction for this force. And then we're going to take a measurement of the displacement from equilibrium position at a location that is part way down the beam. So the output here is Y and we're measuring this at a point that's epsilon L from the left side of the beam. L is the length of the beam so epsilon is just a fraction locating where we are that we're taking the measurement. So if epsilon equals one half, then we're taking the measurement precisely at the center of the beam. If epsilon is equal to one, then we're taking it at the right end of the beam. What we're going to do is examine how the transfer function varies with epsilon. Now in this example, the beam has mass m and it's a uniform beam so it's same cross section all the way through and so its inertia is 1 12th ml squared and that's the inertia about the center of mass which is right in the middle of the beam. So our goal here is to find the differential equations and then find the transfer function between the force input and the output y. My first step in deriving the equations of motion is to work on the kinematics. So I'm going to define the displacement of the left end of the beam away from its equilibrium position as x1 and at the right end of the beam that amount of deflection from equilibrium I'll label x2. The displacement of the beam from the equilibrium at the center of mass I'll denote xcm and I'll define the rotation of the beam about the center of mass in a counterclockwise direction as angle theta. Now relating our variables I'll have x1 equals xcm minus L over 2 times theta and x2 equals xcm plus L over 2 times theta. And in doing this, I'm using small angle approximation where sine theta is approximated as theta. So now having completed the kinematics for the springs, I'll do the kinematics for the output signal. And recall that the output is the displacement of the beam at epsilon L from the left end. This is displacement of the beam from the equilibrium position of the beam. So it's simple kinematics as we had in the previous page. We're looking at what's happening at epsilon over L away from the left end of the beam, which is epsilon L minus one half L away from the center of mass. So we simply need to multiply that by theta, again using small angle approximation where sine theta is approximated by theta. That then yields the relationship we're looking for which is y, the displacement, is equal to xcm, the displacement of the center of mass, plus epsilon minus one half times L times theta. Now with our kinematics complete, we're ready to find our equations of motion. We'll start with our free body diagram for the beam. What forces are acting on the beam? We have a spring force on the left hand side, which I'm calling F1, a spring force acting on the right hand side, which I'm calling F2, and the applied force, labeled F, acting on the left side of the beam. I'm choosing to have the upward direction be the positive direction for all three of these forces. Since upward is also the positive direction 
for displacements x1 and x2. I know the relationship between my spring forces and these displacements. F1 will be equal to minus k times x1, and F2 will be equal to minus k times x2. So, I can now write my equations in motion. I have m xcm double dot, that's the acceleration of my center of mass, equal to some of the forces acting on the rigid body, which is F plus F1 plus F2. And then I have a separate equation for rotation about the center of mass, and that's going to be I, the moment of inertia, times theta double dot, the angular acceleration, and that's equal to the sum of the moments acting about the center of mass. That will be minus L over 2 times F, minus L over 2 times F1, plus L over 2 times F2. Only F2 is providing a positive moment about the center of mass. The others provide a negative moment, and the positive direction for moment, of course, is counterclockwise, which is the positive direction for the angle theta. So simplifying these equations, I'll find the following. m xcm double dot plus 2k xcm equals f, and i theta double dot plus 1 half k l squared theta equals 1 half l f. These are my two equations of motion for the system. One for the motion of the center of mass, and the other for the rotational motion about the center of mass. You'll note that both of these are linear differential equations, and so we're free to use all the techniques we've developed in this class on them. So now we'll Laplace transform these differential equations and for that purpose we'll assume that all initial conditions are zero. And after we Laplace transform we'll find ms squared plus 2k times xcm equals f of s and is squared plus 1 half k l squared times theta of s equals 1 half l f of s. Then we'll divide through by the terms multiplying xcm of s and theta of s on the left hand side and find our transfer functions. So xcm of s equals 1 over ms squared plus 2k times f of s. And so the term in the square brackets is our transfer function between input force f and output displacement xcm. And then for the other equation, we'll have the transfer function between the input force f of s and the rotation of the beam as 1 half L divided by I S squared plus 1 half K L squared. Both of these transfer functions are second order and have no zeros. Here we repeat them again. The one between the input force and the displacement of the center mass is 1 over M S squared plus 2 K and the one between the input force and the rotation of the beam about the center of mass is 1 half L divided by IS squared plus 1 half KL squared. XCM and theta are referred to as modal coordinates. They have the following property. If we choose either one as the output, then the other would not be observable. So if we were put a sensor and measured the motion of the center of mass, we wouldn't be able to see what was happening with the rotation about the center of mass. Or, if we had a sensor that could measure the rotation, we couldn't see what the deflection at the center of mass was. The idea behind modal coordinates is that we can think of any motion of the beam as being a combination of these two types of motion. One motion being the motion of the center of mass, that is the beam moving up and down. The other being the motion of the beam about the center of mass, that is the rotation 
Commonly, these are called the bounce mode and the tilt mode of the beam. The bounce mode would be the beam moving up and down on the springs, but there's no rotation. And in the tilt mode, there's rotation about the center of mass with the springs moving one first compressed and then the other, but there's no motion of the center of mass. We can think of any motion of the rigid beam as being a combination of a certain amount of bounce and a certain amount of tilt. And so that's the idea behind modal coordinates, is that any motion can be made of a combination of these two modes. We already gave the kinematic equation that allowed us to express the displacement at any point along the beam in terms of these two modal coordinates. That equation was y equals xcm plus epsilon minus one half times L times theta. We'll now take that kinematic equation and we'll Laplace transform it. So we have output y of s is equal to xcm of s plus epsilon minus one half times L times theta of s. Previously we found the transfer function between f of s and these two modal coordinates xcm of s and theta of s. So we can take these expressions and substitute them into the top expression on this page to find y of s in terms of f of s. Before we do that, let me just note that the poles of the bounce mode are the roots of the denominator of the transfer function between f of s and xcm of s. And the poles of the tilt mode are the roots of the denominator of the transfer function between f of s and theta of s. So now let's substitute in the expressions for xcm of s and theta of s into the top equation and find y of s in terms of f of s. After a little bit of algebra, this is what we'll find. So it's a complicated transfer function, but let's talk about it on a conceptual level. We have a fourth order denominator, so there's gonna be four poles. And you see that denominator's already factored. We have one term, which is the poles of the bounce mode, and the other term, which is for the poles of the tilt mode. And you'll note that the numerator is second order, so this system will have two zeros. Let's sketch these poles and zeros in the complex plane. So first we'll have the poles of the bounce mode, which I've labeled one here, and they're on the imaginary axis. They're at plus and minus j square root of 2k over m. Then we'll have the poles of the tilt mode, which will be at plus or minus j square root of 6k over m. Now I've substituted in here the fact that we're using a uniform beam, which means i is equal to 1 12th ml squared, and that's allowed me to simplify the expression for this tilt mode. Then I have the zeros, and they'll also appear on the imaginary axis. They're at plus and minus j square root of 2k over m times square root of epsilon over epsilon minus one third. And you'll note right away that the poles of the bounce mode and of the tilt mode don't depend upon epsilon, but the zeros do. So the poles are not dependent upon where we choose to use as an output location, but the zeros are dependent upon the choice of the output location. We illustrate here the dependence of the zeros on the output location. I have a graph of the imaginary part of the zeros as a function of epsilon. Note that as epsilon is increased, that is as we move the sensor farther and farther away from the left end of the beam, we have the zeros decreasing in magnitude. That is, they're moving closer to the origin. 
for epsilon equals one half, which would be the sensor at the center of the beam, the value of the zeros is square root of 6k over m, which is the same as the value of the tilt mode poles. Then, when epsilon is increased all the way to 1, which means the sensor is at the right end of the beam, the value of the frequency of the zeros is square root of 3k over m. That value is greater than the imaginary part of the bounce mode poles, but less than that of the tilt mode poles. You might be wondering what happens to the zeros if epsilon is less than one-third. That is, if the sensor is placed very close to the left end of the beam. The answer is that the zeros are real valued, and they appear as mere images about the origin on the real axis. We'll now graph these results that we found for the pole and zero locations as a function of epsilon. We'll label the frequency of the bounce mode, square root of 2k over m, as omega 1, and the frequency of the tilt mode, square root of 6k over m, as omega 2. The location of the poles and zeros in the complex plane for epsilon between one-third and one-half is shown in the graph on the far left. And you note that the zeros are at a higher frequency, that is farther up the imaginary axis, than the tilt mode poles at omega-2. The center figure shows where the poles and zeros are for the case epsilon equals one-half, that is the center is at the center of the beam. You'll note that the zeros lie precisely on top of the poles of the tilt mode at omega-2. The cancellation of the poles and zeros here, in this case, indicate that the tilt mode is not observable if you have the sensor placed at the center of mass. The case on the right side is for epsilon between one half and one. That is, the sensor is placed between the center of the beam and the far right side. In this case, the zeros are interlaced with the poles. So the zero is a frequency higher than the bounce mode, but lower than the tilt mode. We'll now look at the zero input response of our system. So we'll go back to our differential equations that we had for the center of mass and also for the rotation and we'll Laplace transform them. But now we're going to have non-zero initial conditions and we're going to make the input zero. So that gives us these equations here in the center of the page. After Laplace transformation we now have the initial conditions on xcm, xcm dot, theta, and theta dot showing up in the problem. Now each of these equations describes a second order system with prescribed initial conditions and so we can solve for xcm and theta independently. So we can solve those equations for xcm of s and theta of s and then we can inverse Laplace transform to find XCM of t and theta of t. And this is the characteristic of these solutions. They will both be sinusoidal responses to the initial conditions. XCM will be the sinusoidal response with a frequency of omega 1, which is the bounce mode frequency, and an amplitude in phase that will be determined by the initial conditions xcm at time zero and xcm dot at time zero. Then theta will also be a sinusoid, but now with the frequency of the tilt mode. And the amplitude and phase of this sinusoid will be determined by the initial conditions on theta and theta dot. 
This is the nature of working with modal coordinates. If we give the initial conditions on the modal positions and modal velocities, then we can solve for the modal motion without having to consider the other modes. Each mode can be solved for independently as a solution of a second order differential equation. To give a better sense of the modal motion, let's consider an example. Let's suppose we pick the center of mass, position, and velocity at the initial time to be zero, but we pick theta and theta dot at the initial time to be non-zero. In this case, xcm will be zero for all time. The center of mass will not move. That's the solution of the differential equation for xcm. But theta of t will be doing a sinusoid. The exact amplitude and phase dependent upon the initial conditions. So only the tilt mode will be excited. When theta of t is changing sinusoidally, the beam will be rocking back and forth, rotating about its center of mass. The center of mass position will not move, and this is called a node of this mode of vibration. The distribution of deflection across the structure, when it is vibrating in one mode, is referred to as the mode shape of the vibration. The mode shape for the tilt mode is shown in the diagram to the left. You can see from this diagram that the center point of the beam does not move when this mode is excited. That is the location of the node. It indicates that this mode is unobservable if a sensor is placed at the center of the beam.